Topping finish. Champions touch. Vaulting one record. Stealing another. Taking the date. was in 1962 in sports when records and athletes fell with abandon in summer as well as winter in snow as well as shine In hockey, the contact is all between the players. As any Boy Scout will tell you, rub two sticks together often enough, you get fire. Both hot ice altercations occurred between the Montreal Canadiens in dark uniforms and Chicago Blackhawks during the campaign for the Stanley Cup. As it turned out, the best men were the Toronto Maple Leafs, here tying the sixth game of the playoffs against Chicago. Coming up, the Leafs' second goal and final one of the season. The Leafs skate off with the Stanley Cup for the first time in 12 years. Hoopster, Hoopla, all season went to Ohio State, rated the best in the nation. Led by All-America Superstore Jerry Lucas, the Buckeyes went undefeated for 47 regular season games over two years until they met an unheralded Wisconsin team. Sharp shooting from the sides, keeping Lucas under reasonable control, the Badgers give Ohio its first Big Ten licking after a record 27 conference wins. The Badgers riding high. In the National Invitation Tourney, Dayton breaks the jinx. After 10 tries, six times in the finals, the Flyers strafe St. John's to land in the top spot. For Dayton followers, sheer joy. In the NCAA Finals, Jerry Lucas leads the once-defeated Buckeyes against Cincinnati. The two teams had met for the title game the year before, with the Bearcats winning in overtime. At this meeting, Cincinnati needs only regulation time to win 71-59. Breaking 100 in golf means one thing. In pro basketball, it means a new record by Wilt Chamberlain. The seven-foot-one star of the Philadelphia Warriors canned an even hundred points, one game. The only time the century total has been reached in the pro circuit. In the final NBA game of the season, Elgin Baylor of the Los Angeles Lakers scored 41 points. Tied at three games apiece, and at 100 points each at the end of regulation time, the Boston Celtics' Bill Russell leads the way in overtime. Then wizard Bob Cousy runs out the clock to seal another year of Celtic supremacy. Like the four-minute mile, the 16-foot pole vault presented a supreme challenge, a seemingly unattainable goal. But Marine Corporal John Ulysses, with a fiberglass pole, scaled the record barrier. The barrier once breached, other vaulters followed Ulysses into the athletic stratosphere. That same February day in New Zealand, Peter Snell is setting a new half-mile record. 
The week before, he had run the mile in an incredible 3.54.4, the new record. Now he covers the half mile in one minute, 45 and one tenth. A week later at Los Angeles, Snell betters the thousand yard indoor mark in one of the most amazing record breaking bursts in track history. But on this evening, even Snell must share the spotlight. 27 year old Jim Beatty, getting better with age, becomes the first man to run a mile indoors under four minutes. 11 times around the smaller indoor track, the hard driving Beatty crosses the finish line in 3.58 and 9 tenths seconds. The five foot six inch Beatty made it clear he's the best American miner in the business at the AAU championships. In this remarkable race, the first four miners all finish under four minutes. Beatty, Jim Grell, Terry Weisiger, and Bill Dotson. Grell just makes it to the finish, then collapses. In the greatest U.S. track and field spectacle since the 32 Olympics, American men sought a fourth straight team victory against Russia. U.S. women lost a fourth straight time despite Wilma Rudolph Ward, one of the all-time great women runners. Reliable Ralph Boston helps the U.S. men to their most decisive victory yet. 14 victories in 22 events. High point for the Americans when Harold Connolly tosses the hammer 231 feet 10 inches, breaking his own world record by more than a foot. Valerie Brumel contributes the high point for Russia and the world, breaking his world high jump record by a full inch. Bo Brumel rockets 7 feet 5 inches. This east-west competition could end in friendship and smiles. The 88th Kentucky Derby, providing cool women and cooler drinks, fast horses, and perhaps the fastest track in Churchill Downs history. Rydan was the favorite, but decidedly, on the outside, breaks the record set by Whirlaway in 1941. A third derby win for jockey Bill Hartak. The Preakness, second tier of the Triple Crown, builds to a thrilling stretch fight between Greek Money on the rail and the again favored Rydan. Greek Money seems to falter, then surges to win by a nose. The Preakness was a hard act to follow, but the Belmont Stakes suffers not a bit. With Eddie Arcaro watching from the stands, Admiral's Voyage on the rail, and Jaipur lock in a heart-stopping duel. Whichever horse's head is up leads by a nose. The winning nose belongs to Jaipur, Willie Shoemaker aboard. Other jockeys got a break this year. Eddie Arcaro retired. The greatest money-winning jockey of all time booted home more than 4,700 winners in 30 years. The only jockey to win the Derby five times, this recalls Eddie's win on the great Whirlaway, Mr. Longtail, on the way to the Triple Crown. The golf story of the year is the clash between Arnold Palmer and Jack Nicklaus. The old pro, king of the links, and the new pro just starting out. In a sport that can make strong men nervous wrecks, Palmer specializes in the come-from-behind fighting finish. The Masters ended in a three-way tie, whereupon Palmer wins the playoff, his third Masters title, by three strokes. Now he was going for a grand slam. And when the National Open ended in a tie, Arnold seems the logical choice in the playoff. Nicholas sees things differently. Out driving and out putting Palmer, playing with an ice water calm to the envy of veterans, Nicholas wins by three strokes.
only 22 years old, the U.S. champion. The PGA was the stage for Gary Player of South Africa. And some scintillating golf. The first non-American to win the Masters the year before, Player is the first non-resident to take the Professional Golfers Association title. Now the three big tourney winners meet in a new World Series of Golf. Palmer the favorite to win the whopping $50,000 first prize, Nicholas's third choice. Player given a five to nine chance in the Battle of Titans. Player bubbles over after this 60 footer. With the last smile, the $50,000 one is worn by Nicholas, conqueror of Palmer and Player, U.S. champ, big money winner, and Jack Nicholas has barely begun. Weatherly and Gradle, in what has become the classic tests of yachts, sailors, and sailing. Since 1851, U.S. vessels had defeated 17 challengers for the America's Cup, losing only five races in all that time. The Weatherly won the right to defend, and boatsmen from all over the eastern seaboard flocked to the waters off Newport, Rhode Island. Weatherly takes the lead against the first 12-meter yacht ever built in Australia at a cost of some $700,000. Handsome and Gradle in a duel of grit and grace. Weatherly wins four out of five, a tribute to both the sleek vessel and slick skipper, Buss Mossbacker. Britain will challenge in 64. Other aquatic feats, the women's AAU and a world's record in the making by Sharon Fenneran of Los Angeles in the 200 meter butterfly race. Sharon is 16 years old, the same age as another young star, Carolyn and House. Carolyn sets a new U.S. record in the freestyle. But the great freestyle achievement is that of Australia's Dawn Fraser, the first woman to swim 100 meters in less than one minute. A slow motion look at the stylish freestyle of the remarkable Miss Fraser. A new sport winning aficionados down under is what might be called a shark lark. Rushing in where angels fear to tread, the shark baiter pushes his luck. With a population explosion and everything, where must a shark go for some privacy? In 1962, Rod Laver had left, still another Aussie chap, walked onto the best-groomed courts of the world and walked off with a grand slam. This is Lefty Laver knocking over fellow countryman Roy Emerson in Paris. Wearing the Aussie, French, and Wimbledon crowns, 
Labor again meets Emerson in the finals at Forest Hills. The U.S. Championship gives Labor the Big Four titles won by only one other player, Don Budge. Rod the rocket in orbit. The Golden Gloves for young, strong hopefuls beginning careers. Hard beginning for some. Career's end for Benny Kid Perret, killed in action. The former welter champ left a widow and not much else to show for his ring career. Emil Griffith, the new champ, was absolved of any blame in Perret's death. In the heavyweight division, mild-mannered title holder Floyd Patterson signs to take on rough, tough-talking Sonny Liston, 25 pounds heavier. Experienced observers felt that the challenger packed too much brute power, but Floyd is the sentimental favorite. This is how Patterson looked towards the upcoming encounter. Well, I'm prepared to go 15 rounds, but uh, I personally don't think that it will. And that's the understatement of the year. Spectators who blinked missed the climax. Listen by a knockout in two minutes, six seconds. Patterson was the big winner, though taking better than half of the more than two million dollar affair. Hereafter, Liston will get the lion's share. Major League Baseball comes to Texas. The Houston Colt 45s join the newly expanded 10-team National League. Led by astute general manager Paul Richards, the Colts give their fans usherettes and an eighth place finish. Casey Stengel, who learned winning ways with the Yankees, led the new New York Mets with the aid of such coaches as Rogers Hornsby, Red Ruffing, and Cookie Lavagetto. New York, a one-team town since the pullout of Giants and Dodgers, opens its heart and hopefully awaits the old professor's diamond magic. Operating out of the old polo grounds, the Mets at once show what they're made of, losing their first nine games to tie a league record. They go on to shatter all sorts of venerable records with a spectacular display of losing baseball. Venerable Stan Musial added another record to an already sizable collection. Most hits by a national leaguer. He topped the 3,430 made by the great Honus Wagner. Stan the man with power, staying as well as hitting. But it's Maury Wills, the league's most valuable and exciting player. The Los Angeles Whippet perfected base stealing to such an art that he succeeded in eight of every nine tries breaking what appeared to be Ty Cobb's most impregnable record. Will stole 104 bases during the season. He's allowed to keep this one. Will's Dodgers and the San Francisco Giants end the season with a restaging of their famous playoff of 11 years before. Again, the Giants win, but without the earlier heroics. This is San Francisco's first pennant. And when the Giants return from Los Angeles, the town is waiting. To Candlestick Park come the Golden Gate faithful and the New York Yankees, the well-rested defending world champions. Wasting no time, the Yanks' Bobby Richardson singles in the first. Tom Tresh follows with another single, setting the stage for Roger Maris. Maris doubles, 
sending home the two base runners and pointing the Bombers toward a 6-2 win. The second game is a pitcher's battle until Giant Willie McCovey unloads a bomb in the seventh. Giant pitcher Jack Sanford gains a 2-0 victory. Back in their own stadium, the Yankees win again, but the Giants, who never say die, but only say hey, strike back. Another baseball first. Bases loaded. Chuck Hiller up. Grand slam. The first bases loaded home run by a National Leaguer in World Series history. Giants seven, Yankees three, two games apiece. Ralph Terry, who lost to Sanford in the second game, again the Mount adversaries for the fifth. Sanford Wild pitches in the fourth, and Tom Tresh, who had doubled, scores the first run off Sanford in 13 innings. Rookie of the year, Tresh, and a fateful pitch by Sanford in the eighth. A three-run game-winning wallop. And the series returns to San Francisco, where the Giants even the games at 3-all. The seventh tingles your spine. This great seventh inning catch by Tresh preserves a 1-0 Yankee lead. Bottom of the ninth, Mays doubles with two out and a man on first. Matty Alou, the tying run, is held at third, providing plenty of ifs to fuel the hot stove league. Then McCovey lices a shot right at Richardson, a few feet to either side or higher, and there might not have been this familiar ending. Winners and still champions for the 20th time, the New York Yankees, which just about makes them tougher to beat than City Hall. In football, the play's the thing. Sample this one. Nanowski to Jim Brown, to Ray Renfro, back to Nanowski, and then a pass for the Cleveland Browns. Or among the college teams, Ray Wilkins of the LSU Tigers bolting for pay dirt. Norm Sneed of the Washington Redskins throwing, Bobby Mitchell catching. The Skins battery is hot this day, but Y8 Tittle of the New York Giants is sizzling to end Del Schaffner. Again Tittle, again Schaffner. This time a sensational grab by Joe Walton. Tittle tossed seven touchdown passes, tying a pro record set long ago by Sid Luckman, a cogent reason for the Giants repeated as Eastern champs. Atlanta, Georgia, the day Tech rambled over defending national champion Alabama. Late in the game, Tech quarterback Billy Lothridge's knee touches before he gets off a kick, and the Crimson Tide, trailing 7-0, gets a shot from the nine. Bama scores, goes for a two-pointer, and loses their first loss in 27 games. Southern Cal, UPI's top team for 62 in action. All-America end, Cal Bedsoe taking and going. Left half, Willie Brown for 56 yards against Navy. The Trojans completed their first undefeated season in 30 years. Their Rose Bowl opponent, Wisconsin, 
Vander Kellen to Kroner in the style that won the Big Ten title. Oregon State quarterback Terry Baker, UPI's choice for All-America, and a TD pass against Oregon. Left-handed Baker, Heisman Trophy winner, led State to victory despite a great effort by another All-America, Mel Renfro, snaring this pass. The Army-Navy game, brassy setting for midshipman Roger Staubach, passer deluxe. With the poise of an admiral, Staubach gives the cadets a lesson in evasive maneuvers before sending off another aerial strike. When Army deploys to stop the passes, why Staubach simply runs. This is the bomb that gave Navy an unprecedented four straight victories over Army, causing Army and Navy to raise that grand old cry, wait till next year.